Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority.
Sama. Ano check mo na? Yung check or or
Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Music Mofi Sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Music Mofi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded, and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval.
webinar will begin in 10 minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the New Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year. In cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the New Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval.
the webinar will begin in five minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the New Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year. In cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the New Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded, and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. Good morning, everyone. 
I am Julian Gabat, New Sigma Phi Sorority, Batch 2012, speaking in behalf of the Aging and Longevity Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority. We are streaming live from the video conference room of the UP Manila Information Management Service, and our time today in Manila is now exactly 12.01. We have a total of 900 plus registered to this webinar from all over the Philippines and from other countries as well. Hello to our viewers from Northern Luzon, Cabanatuan, Lawag, Santiago, Kawayan, San Fernando, La Union, and Pangasinan. For today's webinar, we are privileged to have a very distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine, Class 2001 as our speaker. She completed her internal medicine residency at Cleveland Clinic Akron General, Akron, Ohio in 2006, and completed her fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at the UPPGH in 2012. She completed observership in bone and mineral disease in Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, also a certified clinical densitometrist, as well as published several researches on calcium and bone disorders, thyroid and parathyroid disorders, diabetes, obesity, and chronic diseases, etc. She is a member of the American College of Physicians, American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, Endocrine Society, International Society for Clinical Densitrom Densitometry, Osteoporosis Society of the Philippines Foundation Incorporated, and many more. She is also currently a contributor contributor in the health corners of the Philippine Star and the Diabetes Magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud and honored to welcome Dr. Monica Therese Cating Cabral, Mu Sigma Phi Sorority Batch 2001. Thank you, Trudy, and good afternoon, everybody. So today we are going to be talking about osteoporosis and bone health, and these are my disclosures. So first, let's start off with bone physiology. You should all remember that bone is living tissue and that old bone is constantly broken down and replaced by new bone. This is a process called bone remodeling and it helps repair micro damage in the skeleton to, to maintain our skeletal strength and it supplies calcium as well from the skeleton to maintain your serum calcium. So the way this happens is through activation first of a resorption area by the osteoclasts, cells which chew up the bone and form a resorption pit. The active osteoclast then continues to chew up the bone and then osteoblasts, which are the cells that build bone, lay down something called osteoid. So osteoid is new bone that has not been mineralized yet and it will be followed by the impregnation of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus and other minerals to create new mineralized bone. So when you look at the anatomic structure of bone, these are transiliac crest biopsy specimens. You will see on the left that there's this nice cortex and the trabeculae which traverse the length of the bone, which they form these trusses which um, cause uh, and create this support system within the bone, making the bone very strong. And you will also see that there's hematopoietic and fatty marrow in between these trabeculae. But as opposed to the osteoporotic bone on the right, you will see that the cortices are very thin, there is loss of the trabeculae, and this bone looks very weak. So what indeed is osteoporosis? It is a disease characterized by low bone mass. As you saw in the biopsy, there is loss of the bone structures and there is microarchitectural deterioration of the bone tissue. This makes the bone weak or fragile and consequently there's an increased risk for fracture. So osteoporosis occurs when you just can't make enough new bone to keep up with the removal of the old bone. So the bone becomes weaker and likely to fracture. Fractures can happen very easily, so we call these fragility fractures. It can happen if you're just walking, standing, if you fall from a standing height or even less. You can trip, cough, bend over, and break a bone that way. So very low trauma, low force, causing a fracture. We call those fragility fractures. If you don't know if you have osteoporosis at the time, you may have osteoporosis if you develop a fragility fracture. Now, fractures can occur anywhere. We usually exclude fractures in the skull, hands and feet as osteoporotic fractures, but they're not impossible as well. But they're most common in the vertebrae, femur, and the distal forearm. So why is it a problem? If you look at this graph, and this was generated some time ago, 
In the next 30 years, there will be an exponential rise in the risk for hip fractures in Asia. And this is because there's, we're just getting older. There are just older patients, our population is getting older, we're living longer. But the burden of suffering is really related to the incidence of fractures. You could have osteoporosis but not fracture, but the risk is increased. One osteoporotic fracture actually occurs every three seconds. And by the age of 50, about one in three women and one in five men will suffer a fracture in the remaining lifetime. For women, the risk for hip fracture is, each, is actually even more than the risk of breast, ovarian, and uterine cancer combined. And for men, the risk of hip fracture is more than the risk of prostate cancer. So half of those who do have one osteoporotic fracture can have another within that same year and then the risk of new fractures rising exponentially with each fracture. So once you've fractured, you can continue to fracture and fracture even more. So it does increase exponentially with age. The older you get, the higher your risk. Older patients also tend to fall more. And the elderly represent the fastest growing segment of our population. So this equates to increased financial burden and more human costs, especially when there's increased life expectancy. So how does it happen in the first place? It's multifactorial. It's not just menopause. Osteoporosis can happen in men as well. You can have weak bones when you're younger, which will equate to weak bones when you're older. So when there's more bone resorption than bone formation for whatever disease state there is, that can also lead to bone loss. If you have low peak bone mass, you can also develop weaker bones as you get older. And then you have poor bone quality to begin with. All of these equate to fractures, and especially if you fall, you could fracture as well. Now, osteoporosis occurs more as we age, but it is not a natural part of aging. So the misconception there is, if you get older, you will have osteoporosis. So no, it's not a given. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean that you're going to have osteoporosis. So how does it start? We develop bones from our childhood, we achieve peak bone mass around your 30s here, okay? And by your 20s or 30s, old bone is actually still replaced by enough new bone to maintain its integrity. But as you get older, there's more old bone than new bone. You're just not replacing it. So if we started early here in our youth, developing good bones, making strong bones, until you achieve your best possible peak bone mass in your 20s and 30s, then it's like an insurance policy for when you get older. So you will see here, this green line is your bone density, and there's that pubertal growth spurt, and you can see that your bone density is at its best at this age. So the younger patients, 15 to 30s, even in your early 40s. The reason is that resorption and formation are here, and they're mostly equal. But you will see, when the kids are younger, in their teenage years, there's actually bone, for more bone formation. So this is where we should encourage our children to exercise, run outside, get enough calcium and vitamin D so they can achieve their peak bone mass. And then once you hit menopause, once you're in your 50s and older, then bone resorption overtakes bone formation. And that's why there's a decline in your bone density. So if you have better bone density early on, then the rate of loss of bone as you get older will be less as well. So one of the most common causes for osteoporosis is menopause. And menopause is defined as the absence of menstruation for about 12 consecutive months, so about a year, or from any cause, could be surgical as well. But it's usually when you don't have a period anymore for about one year. There are a lot of secondary causes and a lot of diseases, which include malabsorption, a lot of endocrine diseases like hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, and Cushing syndrome as well. Patients with renal and liver disease are also at risk for osteoporosis. And even patients with diabetes, whether it be type 1 or type 2, can have osteoporosis also. There are a lot of medications that can cause osteoporosis, cause weakening of the bones. The most common is glucocorticoids or steroids, commonly used in patients with rheumatologic conditions. But other medications, such as anti-seizure medications, HIV medications, even patients who are um, constantly on proton pump inhibitors, that puts patients at risk as well for osteoporosis. So why should we screen for osteoporosis? Well, because it's a silent disease. You actually don't feel your bones getting weaker. It occurs without symptoms. And you only feel something when you've actually broken a bone already. And by then, it's too late. So it's better to screen and prevent that first fracture from happening. 
And this is because there are crippling consequences of osteoporosis-related fractures. Five to 20% die within one year of that first hip fracture. 80% cannot carry out at least one independent activity of daily living. 30% can have permanent disability. And 40% may be unable to walk independently. Other complications, if you have a hip fracture, you could have a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. If you have vertebral fractures, you could develop restricted lung disease because the area where of the lung volume just becomes smaller, as well as lumbar fractures causing abdominal distension, early satiety, and constipation. So what are the risk factors? If you've had a parent with osteoporosis or who had a history of a hip fracture that puts you at risk, the older you get, it increases your risk as well. If you've had a previous fracture, ethnicity also matters. Caucasians and Asians are actually at higher risk for osteoporosis and a low body weight. So when you have uh, a lower body weight, you're underweight, you don't need as much bone strength to carry up that body weight so that puts you at risk for osteoporosis, but it's not an excuse to be overweight or obese. Current smoking and excessive alcohol consumption are also identified as risk factors for osteoporosis. So who should be screened? Not everybody needs to be screened, but at least anybody who is um, more than 65 for women or 70 for men, postmenopausal women who are younger than that age, and men who can also have risk factors should be screened. If you are an adult with a disease or condition associated with low bone mass or bone loss, for example, patients uh, with one hormonal therapy, for example, for breast cancer or prostate cancer, they can be at risk. Patients who take steroids uh, on a chronic basis cannot come off the steroids, should also be screened for osteoporosis. Anybody who has had a fragility fracture, so that fracture from minimal trauma or a fracture from standing height or less, they should also be screened for osteoporosis. So how do you diagnose it? Remember I said it's a silent disease. So if you have some symptoms, back pain suddenly, or um, back pain after you've bent over or done some physical activity, if you were losing height over time, or you have a stoop posture. This stoop posture, posture is not always osteoporosis. Sometimes it's just due to bad posture. But if you're stooped over and elderly with risk factors, maybe you should be screened. And of course, if you've had a fracture that occurs much more easily than expected. So we see these all the time, these peripheral bone density tests. It can be a calcaneal ultrasound or a wrist ultrasound. These are not the gold standard for the diagnosis of osteoporosis. But if you do have one of these tests and it is abnormal, follow up with the gold standard, which is a central bone mineral density testing using a dual energy X-ray absorptometry machine or a DEXA machine. You should use it in a facility with accepted quality assurance measures, meaning that they do um, have regular um, maintenance for these machines, and you should do it at the same place every time. So bone mineral density testing shows that, that there's a relative risk of fracture that increases as your bone mineral density decreases. So the representative areas are the lumbar spine, the femur or the hip, and also the radius of the non-dominant hand that needed. And this is similar to what the most reports look like, but you should always perform repeat testing on the same machine. So we check um, every one to two years, and each machine has its own what we call least significant change. And what we see from year to year is if the increase in the bone mineral density has increased enough over this least significant change to say that the change is indeed real and significant. So how do we define osteoporosis using bone density? There is a T-score, which compares the bone density of the patient to a normal 30-year-old adult. And you are diagnosed to have osteopenia if your score is between minus 1 and minus 2.5, and osteoporosis at less than minus 2.5. What about the Z-score? This is something that is also placed on the report. This is actually an age-matched comparison of the bone density. So it compares the patient to a population of the same age. So it's normal if it's above minus two, and you call it low bone density for age, not osteoporosis. So the term of osteoporosis is only used for patients who are postmenopausal or above the age of 65. Less than minus two would be somebody who has low bone density for age on the Z-score. Now, if your Z-score is much lower than T-score, you should consider secondary osteoporosis causes in your patient. What if your area does not have a bone density machine? 
Well, we have something called the osteoporosis screening tool for Asians. This has been validated and has a 91% sensitivity and 45% specificity to detect a femoral neck bone density T-score of less than minus 2.5. So it's a simple table that uses weight on top and then the age on the left-hand side. And you will see that the thinner you are and the older you are in the red, you're at higher risk for osteoporosis. So this is a simple tool that we can use in the community if the bone density machine is unavailable. There's also something called vertebral fracture assessment, and it is recommended for older women or women who have a T-score of minus 1 or minus 2.5 or minus 1.5. And anybody who's had low trauma fracture, a historical height loss of more than 1.5 inches, or prospective height loss, as you follow the patients, they're losing height of more than 2 centimeters per year, or if they have recent or ongoing long-term steroid treatment. So what happens with the vertebrae, in the normal rectangular box-like vertebrae, they become crunched down and you have bone loss. And these are called vertebral compression fractures. And you will see here on the right, that is the vertebral fracture assessment, measuring and assessing the vertebrae one by one, showing that there are some vertebral compression fractures already. Some patients don't even feel this as well. As you can imagine, if you have wedge compression fractures like this, then the patient can really be stooped over if it is due to these types of fractures. So how do we reduce the risk for osteoporosis? Lifestyle is always first. You should get enough calcium and vitamin D in your diet. It does not have to be tablets. If you can get it in the diet, that's even better. You should also get enough vitamin D because vitamin D is what helps you absorb calcium in your diet. If you can't tolerate dairy products, there are other sources of calcium. There's green leafy vegetables, beans, nuts, sardines, which include the bones. Oranges also have some calcium in them. If you do need to take a supplement because you're not getting enough in the diet, calcium carbonate, which is the more common form of calcium, should be taken with food or after food or after a meal and limited to about 500 to 600 milligrams at a time because it's just the only amount that you can absorb at a time. Patients who cannot tolerate calcium carbonate because of a lot of bloating or constipation can actually use something called calcium citrate. The dosing is a little different, about 400 milligrams, but that can be taken with or without food. Now, what about vitamin D? Vitamin D is actually manufactured in your skin, but it has to be sun exposure midday for about 10 to 15 minutes without the benefit of sunscreen or an umbrella or your clothing or window glass or tint. So this is the best way to get vitamin D in the uh, largest amount. Although it's hot, patients are at risk for skin cancer. Um, Asians don't like to go out in the sun too much. So if necessary, then you can take a supplement. So think of vitamin D as a key that unlocks the door to let calcium into the body. So if you're vitamin D insufficient, then you may not be able to absorb that calcium too much. And one way to find out is just to get a simple blood test checking your vitamin D level. Sources of vitamin D other than the sun and the supplement, although it, there's not as much in fatty fish, for example, we don't have a lot of uh, vitamin D fortified foods in the Philippines, but if you can get them, that can help. Mushrooms, I, I was surprised to find out, actually do have a lot of vitamin D in them, but they're the um, mushrooms that have to be eaten raw, white mushrooms. Beef liver, cheese, egg yolks, and even butter can have vitamin D. You should exercise. Weight-bearing exercise helps make the bones stronger. So other patients may only tolerate things like swimming, for example. If that's the only thing that they can do, then that's what we can do. But if you can do weight-bearing exercise, then that's fine. If you do lift weights and you are somebody who has osteopenia or osteoporosis, nothing more than 15 pounds at a time. You should avoid excessive alcohol. No more than one drink per day for women and two for men. But if you don't drink every day, this does not mean that you drink all those seven drinks on Saturday. Stop smoking as well. Smokers also reach menopause on average two years earlier than non-smokers. So that's something to bear in mind. And of course, don't fall. If you don't fall, you won't break something. Now, why is it that it's more particular for patients who are older to break their hips instead of their arms? Well, it's like this. When you're a younger adult, you are moving faster, you're walking um, at a faster pace, you tend to fall forward and land on your hands or on your knees. But older adults, 
they walk slowly and they usually fall even if they're just walking slowly. So they tend to collapse downward and land directly on a hip, sitting down on the floor and that's why they break their hips. So how is osteoporosis treated? There are a lot of medications out there, be they oral, injectable, uh, there are daily injections, there's an every six month injection, there's a once a year daily infu uh, yearly infusion. So talk to your doctor about what the medication should be. If you want to be assessed for osteoporosis, talk to your doctor and get tested and take the prescribed medications so that you can prevent that first fracture. And if you want to learn more about osteoporosis and all of the things that surround it, I would like to invite you to the sixth scientific meeting of the Asian Federation of Osteoporosis Societies. This is in conjunction with the 21st annual scientific meeting of the Osteoporosis Society of the Philippines Foundation Incorporated. And this will be on August 29 to 31. Please visit our website at aphosphilippines2019.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cabral, for that very comprehensive talk. We now have... Okay, that was very comprehensive. Thank I you. learned a lot from me. That's good. So we now have a total of 455 viewing through Facebook Live, 60 viewing through UP Manila live stream, and 87 viewing through YouTube Live. Um, and the total of over 500, around 500 to 600 viewing from all over the Philippines. We would like to thank, we would like to thank BioFam for their support to this webinar. The floor is now open for questions from the audience. Just type in your questions at the Q&A chat box in the right lower corner of the live stream with video window or type in your comments in YouTube Live or send personal messages to FB at Aging Webinars for Facebook Live viewers. Okay. So for the first question, Dr. Cabral, um, can you screen earlier if you have patients or if your patient has pituitary insufficiency or been hypogonad for a very long time, for example, in the mid-20s, or patients who had surgical menopause or those who had total hysterectomy and bilateral salpingophorectomy at, um, at a relatively younger age. So, um, do you have to wait for at least 50 years old or can you screen earlier? No, you don't have to wait. Anybody who has at risk at any age can have bone mineral density screening. Although you may not probably be able to say that it is uh, osteoporosis, and at the age of less than 50, you'll be using the Z-score. But at least you will know that the patient has a low bone density for age, and you can treat the patient appropriately. Because it's really the risk for fracture that you're looking at there. So I do have patients in their 30s and 40s who have had fragility fractures, or patients who have rheumatologic conditions who are on chronic steroid use. They are at very high risk for osteoporosis. So we do screen them. We give them the proper therapy so that we can avoid that first fracture. Thank you very much. We have a question here from our viewer. Can we replace soya milk for cow's milk in place for of cow's milk for calcium supplementation? Yes, that's fine. As long as it does have calcium in it. So look at the labels and see how much calcium is in it. So if you're looking at trying to get 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day, a glass of milk will probably have around 200 milligrams of calcium in it. So soy milk is fine, as long as there really is some calcium content in it. Another question, Doctora, is calcium carbonate beneficial? Or you should really take calcium plus vitamin D? So calcium and vitamin D supplements you should take if they're lacking in the diet. The recommended daily allowance is around 1,200 milligrams for the calcium. Uh, for the vitamin D, it depends on what your level is. So the problem with vitamin D, if you don't check your levels, you don't know what you're, what you, how insufficient you are. 
So the usual supplements only contain around 400 to 600 IU, and that's just a recommended allowance if you are sufficient. But if you have insufficiency, we like the values to be above 30 nanograms per deciliter. So if you get a blood test and it's less than that, depending on how low it is, you may need anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 or even 5,000 international units of vitamin D per day. So it's better to get your levels tested so you know where you're starting from. It'll take about a month uh, for it to go up by 10 if you take 1,000 a month. So if your level's at 20, taking 1,000 IU per day will probably bring up your level about 30 okay. after one month. But it's, every patient is different. Sometimes patients who are overweight or obese may need a little more since it's a fat-soluble vitamin. Uh, it does uh, a deposit more in the fat, so you may need more so that your levels can come up um, higher. But there really are a lot of vitamin D deficient Filipinos because we don't like to go out in the sun. Um, and like us, for example, we're here inside offices, the doctors, people who work the whole day, we hardly get any sun exposure at noontime. I mean, people who work out in the field, they may probably have adequate uh, uh, sun exposure to get like, adequate vitamin D. Uh, level. So those patients may not need vitamin D supplementation, but you'll be surprised. We, they have found that we do have a um, vitamin D receptor mutation and that we're just more, Filipinos are more prone to vitamin D deficiency. But the good news is you just take a supplement and you can bring your vitamin D levels up. Are there any side effects in relation to the last question? Are there any side effects of excessive supplementation of your calcium and vitamin, particularly in those individuals who wasn't able to get, who weren't able to get their baseline vitamin D and calcium levels? Are there any? It's actually very hard to overdose on vitamin D, uh, since it's a fat soluble vitamin. Actually, the excess is converted to something that's water soluble that you excrete through the urine. The problem with taking too much calcium, for example, is there's talk about risk of deposition in places where it's not supposed to go. So in the soft tissues, for example, in the, in the blood vessels, for example. So if you're going to take calcium, better to still get calcium sources from the diet. If you're afraid of overdosing on a supplement, just take one calcium a day and get the rest from the diet. So that way you're not overdoing it. But I wouldn't take um, too many calcium supplements unless prescribed by your physician because there may be some conditions where they need more. So patients, for example, who've had surgery on their thyroid or parathyroids, they may need more calcium. So th that's a different situation. But the regular person, the regular patient, if you can't get enough in your diet, you can take one supplement a day and that should be enough. Thank you, Doctor. Another question. Can carrying heavy load for example, children who are, or who are heavy can predispose you for early osteoporosis or pathologic fracture? If you carry heavy things? Yes. Uh, actually, no. If, if your bones are okay, and actually if you carry even more weight, so weight-bearing exercise, that load on the bone makes the bones a little stronger. But if the bones are already weak and you carry those heavy loads, that increases the risk. So sometimes that's when patients find out that they do have osteoporosis because they carried something heavy or they bent down the wrong way and lifted something the wrong way, and then they developed a fracture. But normal bone should not do that. So it's bone that, that gets affected by you know, minimal, it's, it's still somewhat minimal stress. And uh, it's not like you fell from like 20 feet up, for example. It's lifting heavy things. If you have weak bones, predisposes you to it. But lifting heavy things per se will not make your bones weaker or predispose you to developing osteoporosis. Okay, another question from our viewer. Do you, re do you recommend insure milk to a bedridden patient 82 years of age? Well, it depends if the patient needs more nutrition. Insure is very high calorie and it can help the patient really if he's unable to eat um, enough for, to sustain his needs. Bedridden patients actually are at risk also for osteoporosis. It's because they're not bearing any weight. So these patients are at risk for osteoporosis as well. They should be assessed uh, for osteoporosis because sometimes if uh, they're stroke patients, for example, and they're always bedridden, there may be times when they're moved when they could develop fractures if they're moved the wrong way. So these patients are the ones that should also be screened for osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And the immobilization is because those osteoclasts, those bones that uh, the cells that chew up the bone, they're more active when there's no weight bearing around. And your bones just, uh, when you do weight bearing, the bones get stronger. 
you, de you deposit more of the ulcer, the ulcer blasts are more active. So immobilized patients, uh, astronauts who are in zero gravity, they also develop uh, low bone density. And they also at risk for vitamin D deficiency. Yes, for because they're inside, patient. yes. Okay. How effective is denosumab in increasing bone density in the elderly? So denosumab is one of those medications that is given every six months. It's an injection. It's a monoclonal antibody to the RAMP ligand. Um, and what it does is it prevents the bones from getting weaker. And in that window, the bones can get stronger. So it's a good medication. Uh, it's good for patients who cannot tolerate the oral medications, for example. We give it to patients who also have some renal insufficiency. And the, the data is good showing that you can increase your bone density using the denosumab. The only thing about denosumab is you may have heard of things called drug holidays. So we do drug holidays for the oral bisphosphonates. The oral bisphosphonates, they get impregnated into the bone cells and they just stay there for a very, very long time. So it's been found that if you take the bisphosphonates, the oral ones, uh, for more than five or seven or even 10 years, that you are at risk for something called an atypical fracture. But the benefit of avoiding the first fracture is still higher than the risk for an atypical fracture. So this should not make patients afraid of taking the oral bisphosphonates. But what we do now is at about three or five years, we consider what we call a drug holiday. We come off the bisphosphonate, stop it completely, don't add on or don't do any sequential therapy. And every year we do the bone mineral density again and we reassess. If the bone density continues to stay stable or has not decreased, then we can continue the drug holiday. If the bone density worsens, then we should put them back on medication. The thing with denosumab is once you stop it, if you consider doing a drug holiday, there is actually a very rapid decrease in the bone density and there is an increased risk for fractures. So there have been some reports of vertebral fractures doing a drug after holiday. stopping. There is actually a very rapid and the theory increase there in is once you stop it, the bone density actually decreases to where it was before you started therapy and it could even be worse because by now the patient's also a little older. So the data is pretty good for over 10 years. There's no increased um, signal for a typical femoral fractures or osteonecrosis of the jaw. One of the other things that they're concerned about when you're on long-term therapy for osteoporosis. So the nosomab looks like it's going to be okay to take for about 10 years or more. That's the data that we have. So if, you are, if you're on the nosomab, I would recommend to not do a drug holiday and do not miss any doses. So, so far, it's been shown to be well tolerated, especially for patients who can't remember to take a tablet once a week or once a month. Thank you. Another question. I think it, this has been answered earlier. What will be the problem if you take too much calcium supplement in a day? Mm -hmm. So, you'll have deposition of your calcium in undesired places. You it's can have tissue. kidney stones, soft tissue. Soft tissues. And yes, kidney stones, if you have too many calcium. Vitamin D per se does not have any remarkable or significant um, toxicity. when Unless you're, you're really taking a lot of vitamin D. But that's why you should also measure your levels from time to time, every three to six months, once a year while you're on a supplement. But if you take just 1,000 or 2,000 IU per day, you should be okay. Another question, do you treat osteopenia? So osteopenia, sometimes that's the question, do you treat or not? So we have a, a calculator, actually it's called the FRAX calculator, Fracture Reduction Assessment. And you put in the data of the patient and if you're unsure whether or not you should treat the patient, that can help you. There's a percentage there that more or less says, okay, this patient would probably benefit from therapy. Patients with osteopenia, we should watch them closely, make sure that their calcium and vitamin D levels are okay. But if you have a patient with osteopenia and they have a condition that predisposes them to even worsening of the bones, for example, they're on a lot of uh, medication like steroids, or if they're on hormonal therapy for breast cancer or prostate cancer. So things that are not going to go away. Sometimes we already consider putting them on therapy, bisphosphonate mm -hmm. therapy, because we know that their bone density will just continue to worsen over time. Patients who have osteopenia can also fracture. Just because your, your T-score isn't less than minus 2.5, you can also fracture. 
So patients with osteopenia who have fractured definitely will, we will also treat. So talk to your doctor and see what your risk factors are. Okay, um, another question from Ms. Mirna Africa. If a patient does not respond to IV zolindronic acid or any oral bisphosphonate at that after a year, what's next to give? Well, maybe we should also reassess why it's not working. There may be some underlying conditions that we have not identified yet. Um, some patients, although if you did get zolindronic acid once a year, it's hard to say that you're non-compliant. Sometimes patients who take the oral ones are non-compliant. So if they're not taking it properly, then it won't really work. But if you've ruled out everything and you've tried the zolidronic acid, uh, depending on the bone density, there are two other options. You can do the denosumab, which is every six months, or teriparatide. Teriparatide is the only anabolic uh, drug that we have. The only problem with it is that it's a daily injection. And we are limited to using it for only two years. So after you've used it for two years, you've built up the bone, you have to immediately follow it with something else, like an anti-resorptive, either an oral bisphosphonate or denosumab. The teriparatide is only used for 18 to 24 months because there's increased risk for sarcoma. Although this has only been shown in animal studies, the FDA approval says that we can only use it for two years. Question from Ms. Catherine, what's the maximum dose of calcium for patients with, uh, with a history of fracture? Well, they still say it's about 1,200 still. And if you if, have fracture. But if you've fractured already, sometimes it's actually not the calcium that we're looking at. Maybe it's the vitamin D. So we need to see also what your vitamin D levels are. There are some schools of thought where they want the vitamin D to be a little higher than normal, maybe a little bit above 50 in terms of um, bone healing. Um, but that's also for patients who didn't heal very well. But if they've healed, if they have the history of fracture, then maybe more important uh, than calcium and vitamin D would be an anti-resorptive or a bisphosphonate, a medication specifically for osteoporosis. Because if you've had a fracture already, calcium and vitamin D won't be enough. He said earlier, Doctor, that if you're taking at least a thousand IU of your vitamin D, you're you're good, good at it. Um, what's the maximum dose of your vitamin D, daily yeah. vitamin D that you can take? There's daily? actually no maximum dose. It really depends on the patient's response to vitamin D. So when I say vitamin D, I'm talking about vitamin D3. Oh. So that is cholecalciferol. Cholecalciferol is uh, the vitamin D3. There's also vitamin D2. Now, vitamin D2 is from plant sources. It's uh, ergocalciferol. That one comes in 10,000, 50,000 IU. Now, this can also be given like maybe once a week for patients who have severe vitamin D insufficiency. But the more readily available um, type of vitamin D that we have in the country is vitamin D3. If you have multiple sclerosis or like scoliosis, are you at risk for osteoporosis? Not necessarily, no. So patients who have um, scoliosis or multiple sclerosis, it depends really also if you're able to um, perform weight-bearing exercises and to build up the bones as you're getting older. So sometimes these patients are unable to really exercise. So that's where the risk comes in. But uh, by virtue of just having those illnesses, doesn't mean that your bones are going to get weaker. Even patients have osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is a disease of the joint. It's not of the bone itself. So that doesn't predispose you either to having osteoporosis. But maybe a lack of weight-bearing exercise when you were younger, for example, if the scoliosis was something that happened in younger years, you may not have been able to reach that peak bone mass that I mentioned. So maybe they're at risk for osteoporosis. In, uh, in relation to the osteoporosis, uh, osteoarthritis part, I believe osteoarthritis, particularly those with osteophytes and bone spurs, can actually cause, cause falsely elevated um, bone mineral density scores. Yes. So do you have any adjustments or alternative measurements so you can diagnose osteoporosis properly in this um, a subset of patients? So when we do the bone density testing, we look at the lumbar spine. And if there are any um, of the lumbar vertebrae that seem to be more sclerosed or have osteophytes, we actually eliminate it from the exam. Because like you said, it can falsely elevate the bone density. So those are excluded from the exam. And we, we, we use the remaining uh, lumbar vertebrae to measure. Now, if the patient has had surgery on the lumbar spine, we eliminate that altogether. We do the hips, and then we can look at the 
um, proximal wrist, uh, the distal wrist, the uh, one third of the distal wrist of the non-dominant hand. Okay, so if you're right-handed, you measure the left hand. One of our viewer has hyperthyroidism, and she's asking if it is necessary to have calcium and vitamin D medication as part of her maintenance therapy to prevent osteoporosis, since hyperthyroidism is one of the causes of secondary osteoporosis. Well, calcium and vitamin D are the building blocks of the bones. So if you're not getting enough in your diet, then definitely you should have some. If you're vitamin D insufficient, then you should be taking vitamin D as well. But what's more important with the hyperthyroidism to know is that you should get the hyperthyroidism treated. So as long as it's controlled, then you can um, uh, reduce that risk of developing osteoporosis because then the osteoclast activity on the bones is reduced as well. So as long as the hyperthyroidism is controlled, then it shouldn't increase your risk. But uh, definitely it would be better to get that... Um, um, to get definitive therapy for the hyperthyroidism so that the risk does not continue. So either radioactive iodine therapy or surgery if necessary, or um, taking the medications uh, for an extended amount of time, depending on the situation. Is it still advisable for adults to be exposed to sunlight in the morning for better calcium absorption in the bones? If so, what's the new time recommended because of climate change? So are there any changes? In you said it's midday, about 10 to 3 p.m. So oh, that's a good question. That's does a good climate question. change change this um, time? Okay, well, better you know, they give a range about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So anywhere at that point. I guess if you really want to know when the sun is directly above you, you know, you don't produce a shadow, that kind of thing. Because there's a certain UVB wavelength of light. It's about 275 nanometers, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, you know, early morning sun just doesn't have that range. So if you just did it maybe around noontime, still somehow you would get within that range. Have you encountered jaw osteonecrosis in your practice treated with bisphosphonates? Fortunately, well, fortunately, I have never had one yet in my, in my own practice. But um, it's common enough that we know that it exists. But again, the risk um, of that occurring is much, 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 much less than the benefit that you would achieve by being on a bisphosphonate from avoiding that fracture. So maybe to avoid it in the first place is before you start patients on a bisphosphonate, you should make sure that they've had all their dental work done. I mean, a typical prophylaxis or fillings, that shouldn't be a problem. The patients who may have um, extractions or root canals or dental implants, that may become a problem if they take the bisphosphonates. So I usually make sure that my patients have all their dental work done and everything is healed before we start. But again, it's very, um, the risk is very low, again, for osteonecrosis of the jaw. But if it does happen, then usually what we have to do is um, do prolonged antibiotics, um, follow up with your dentist, of course, your oral hygienist, with your ENT, for example. But um, again, it's, it's not that common. In relation to the last question, Doctor, do you usually or routinely stop your bisphosphonate in case your patient needs a surgery, surgery in the oral cavity or a usual tooth extraction? Well, when you think about how the bisphosphonates work, even if you stop the bisphosphonates, they're still going to be there. So it would not even matter if you stopped it a month before, a week before, the day of the procedure the effect will still be there. Um, patients who are at higher risk for that usually have uh, a lot of infections, really, periodontitis also. So those are the things that have to be looked at um, before you start them on the bisphosphonates. But again, you shouldn't be afraid of being on bisphosphonates because of the possibility of those. It will still be better to prevent the first fracture, which has so many more complications, and even the risk of death when you have that fracture. Question from our viewer, Ms. Nirna Africa. What can you say about the algae, algae calc, al algae calc supplement that is being advertised nowadays? The clinical trials about this say it increases the bone density. In terms of supplementation, there have been no types of supplements or herbal medications that have really been shown to um, increase bone mineral, mineral density. At least there are no randomized control trials that show that. Um, it may be something that is uh, 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 given for bone health because of the presence of calcium in it. 
but I'm not very familiar with that particular supplement. But as far as I know, there are no supplements that can indeed increase your bone mineral density. Okay, another question from our viewer. Early use of contraceptive pills decreases bone density. This is in connection with the increased incidence of teenage pregnancy and teenagers using contraceptive pills. How true is this? Actually, when you do use hormonal therapy, that's one of the therapies that we have for osteoporosis. So being on an oral contraceptive pill does not actually increase your risk for developing osteoporosis. We do use hormonal therapy once patients hit menopause. It's one of the things that we give, although it's a different formulation from those oral contraceptive pills. Um, it actually increases bone density. On coffee, we all love coffee. Do you advise any maximum cups of day to prevent the risk of osteoporosis? Oh, to prevent osteoporosis or decrease the risk of osteoporosis or is it related to osteoporosis? Not so much with coffee. There, there's talk about carbonated drinks, caffeinated drinks, again within moderation, not just for your bone health but also for your blood pressure for example. Uh, I guess it depends on how much, how many cups of coffee you actually consume but within a day two or three is fine. But in terms of um, too much coffee causing a decrease in bone density, there's not too much of an association there. Okay, so this will be our last question because of time constraints. What, do, what dose and duration of corticosteroid therapy would require preventive therapy with this Well, when we talk about, uh, for example, prednisone, and you've been taking it for more than three months at the dose of more than um, five milligrams per day, sometimes that's the dose that increases your risk. But anybody who is on continuous or um, chronic steroids they should really have their bone density checked, especially if they can't come off the steroids. So that's the patient that you should really consider. Okay, one more question. What about calcium carbonate usage in pregnant women, given 500 milligram three times a day, second trimester onwards? Any comment? Can you? That's can about you the this? right dose. That's about the right dose, 1,200 also, up, sometimes up to 1,800 for pregnant women mm -hmm. and women who are also lactating. Women actually who breastfeed can have also a decrease in their bone mineral density, so they should have adequate calcium and vitamin D as well. Okay, thank you for all those questions. Thank you. Okay, we have 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes for... Um, if we have other questions. So I'll ask um, a question. Can you not, can you opt not to do drug holiday? Can you have a sequential therapy instead? For example, you take this phosphonates and you're already five years on it and you're not very confident enough. Can you do enough? Can you do the sequential therapy with, yes, for can. example, denosumab? You can. You can switch from an oral bisphosphonate to the, to the denosumab, for example. Especially patients who have ongoing risk. You know that their bones aren't going to be getting any better because they're on steroids or they have chronic illnesses, they're bedridden, they have cancer, for example, um, that causes bone density to get weaker as well. You can actually um, continue them on sequential therapy. So there's no problem doing that. Now, there are some newer drugs coming out that now may be uh, more acceptable, you know, once a month type of injection and then other weekly ones. But um, sequential therapy is not a bad idea either as long as you just monitor their bone mineral density. So if you're going to do a test on an animal basis, tell the patients to do it around the time of their birthday so that they'll remember. Tell them it's a, a gift to themselves, just so that they remember that every year on the, around the time of my birthday is when I need to do my bone density, make sure they do it in the same place so that we can compare the results from year to year. It's actually supposed to be done in the same machine as well. Can you, instead of giving bisphosphonates, doctora, can you also give your hormonal therapy yes. hormonal therapy in the first few years yes. of your postmenopausal yes. period? Actually, you know, that's the, that's one of the things that we can really do for patients who are 
um, just in getting into menopause, hormonal therapy is actually one of the recommended um, medications that you can use. And you, it doesn't only um, help with the bone density, but it helps also with the symptoms of menopause as well. So you can use it as long as the patient has just started menopause, you know, periods have been gone for about a year. They also have those symptoms, uh, hot flashes, for example, and that can help them immensely. So you kill two birds with one stone. You, you watch out for the, uh, you can control the symptoms and then you can also help with the bone density. Sometimes though, uh, as you monitor the bone density, as the patients get older, they may no longer need um, the hormonal therapy because they have, you don't have any more symptoms. Then you can switch them to other medications like the dysphosphate, depending again on their bone density. They're doing well on the hormonal therapy. Uh, they say as long as the patients are, have symptoms of menopause, they can be easy. Okay, you said a while ago that one of the side effects of your bisphosphonates are the typical fractures. Mm -hmm. How would you um, how would you diagnose, or when would you suspect a typical fractures in your patients? So it's happened as the reports show that it can happen as early as three years. So that's why we start um, considering drug holidays of three to five years. But average is about seven years use of bisphosphonates. So it has a prodrome of inguinal pain or groin pain. Patients can also complain sometimes of pain on the sides of the hips. And it has a very typical appearance on x-ray. It looks like a transverse um, fracture. But even before the fracture, there's actually some findings on x-ray where we call it beaking. So there's just this pointy area at the um, lateral side when you do the x-ray on the femur that can um, maybe indicate that there's a stress fracture there. And I think it can become an empirical uh, femoral fracture. And if you've had one on one side, it can happen on the other. So you should always look at both hips. Okay, there is a comment here that how do we how do we resolve dermatologists and endocrinologists? Of course, your dermatologist would advise you to use sunscreen because of the increased risk of skin cancer, yes. particularly in the time wherein you will yes. have your peak vitamin Correct. D activation, 10 mm -hmm. to 2 p.m. How, um, all the, on the other hand, you have your endocrinologist who um, advise sun exposure mm -hmm. 10 to 15 minutes a day during this very, very um, mm -hmm. hot time or very mm -hmm. you're, when the sun, the when the sun's uv rays is in its, in its maximum so mm -hmm. how would you resolve that would you take a supplement just take a supplement you know if there's an increased risk so there is an increased risk also for skin cancer and honestly nobody really wants to be that hot yes. although some people enjoy it then you it's the risk just know that you're at risk for skin cancer if that's what you opt to do but the simplest way is just to take a supplement so that's the last question for today due to the due to time constraints. Okay, thank you for all those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Cabra, Dr. once again for enlightening us with your answers. So in summary, in summary, we learned from the webinar today that number one, osteoporosis is not part of normal aging and it carries actually a significant morbidity and mortality and a decreased quality of life. That's why we have to screen screen appropriately manage in a timely manner okay screening for patients who are or for um, older population more than equal to 65 years old for women and more than equal to 70 years old for men of course we can screen earlier if we um if the patient has risk factors or if the patient had pituitary insufficiency or had surgical menopause earlier Okay, and if you're found to have osteoporosis, you have to consult your doctor, particularly your endocrinologist, rheumatologist, and specialist about it for, for a timely and appropriate management. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Um, with that, we'd like to thank again Dr. Cabral for taking her time out for, from her very busy schedule and sharing her expertise with, with us today. Please stay tuned for some reminders.
the Aging and Longevity Medical Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority would like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. We are also grateful to support from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, UP Manila Information Management Service, and DOST ASTI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we thank you, our participants, for spending your lunch hour with us. We would also like to thank our sponsor, BioFam. To receive your certificates of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation form by visiting the link on your screen within two days. The certificates will be emailed to your registered email addresses within two to four weeks. Here is a quick view of the schedule of our upcoming webinars. For more details and updates, please check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash agingwebinars and our Twitter timeline at twitter.com slash agingwebinars. Today's webinar recording and all webinar recordings may be viewed at YouTube at Aging Webinars channel. Please join us again on our upcoming webinar as seen on your screen. We are also announcing the launch of the OB Pearls book. Get your copies now. We would also like to invite you to attend the UP Med webinars every Wednesdays. Thank you and have a great day. The Aging and Longevity Medical Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority would like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, UP